Hi, I'm Darren and welcome back to Level Up Double E Lab. On my HF transmitter project, there's one more element to cover before I can get into the RF final amplifier and that's the preamp. And I have two versions that I'm considering using. Let's check them out. In episodes three and six in this series, I talked about the RF preamplifier design and that I had two concepts that I was considering. One based on the classic 2N5109 BJT and the second based on the more modern IRF510 MOSFET. Now the results showed that either one looked like it would work and I left those episodes saying that I was gonna build them both and try them. And that's exactly what I did. Here's the IRF510 version. It measures 33 millimeters by 65 millimeters and uses double-sided material with ground planes interconnected top and bottom. Most of the components are surface mount. Fabrication was pretty quick and easy and the etching process turned out extra nice. I recently made a change to my board etching technique and it noticeably minimized the amount of Swiss cheese effect that I typically have. Yeah, that heatsink might be overkill, but that's what I had in the junk box, so that's what I'm going to run with. Moving on, let's take a look now at the 2N5109 board. It's the same physical size as the IRF510 and is also mostly surface mount construction. It too was quick and easy to fabricate. Now one obvious difference is my choice in heat sinks. All I have is this cute little heat sink to put on the 2N5109, so I am a bit concerned about heat dissipation. So I'll take it a bit carefully when I run the power output testing. All right, I'm in the lab and I've got the IRF510 board set up right here. So let me go through the test setup, what I've got configured. I've got the Heath power supply in the background providing the 12 volts. It's feeding the current through my Keithley uh, multimeter so I can keep track of the milliamps that the uh, whole board is drawing. And right now I've got the bias shut off for the IRF510. So it's just the two transistors and other uh, biasing circuits. So it's only drawing about 53 milliamps. I put this switch here so I can control the bias, uh, turning it on and off. Uh, for the 510. And what I've done is I've adjusted that potentiometer so that I get about 100 milliamps when I turn it on. So right now it's at about 54. I turn it on and it jumps up to about 154. So that's subtract the two, you get about 100 milliamps of idle current going through the 510. And that should put it solidly into class A service, class A operation. Now it may be beyond that point, I may adjust that and tweak it a bit, but just for starting right now, I'll leave it at, at 100 milliamp. The rest of the setup, I've got my HP 8657A signal generator, of course, that's set to seven megahertz. And right now I've got it set to an output of minus 30 dBm. If you recall from my LT Spice simulations, I was targeting around uh, minus uh, 15 to minus 20 dBm to get plus 27 dBm or half a watt output from the amplifier. So I'll start low and work my way up. Now I do have the Tektronix scope hooked up to the output so we can keep uh, a qualitative eye, if you will, on what the signal looks like and see if we can see any distortion kicking in. And then the rest of the output, I've got a 20 dB attenuator here. This is my variable attenuator uh, in line before my power meter. My power meter can only handle about plus 10 uh, dBm, so I'm knocking the signal down there. And then of course I got this multimeter looking at the output uh, voltage from the power meter. So what I'm going to do uh, when I run through this series of tests, I'm going to do various power levels of input, measure the output and generate some plots and see how that data correlates or <laughs> doesn't correlate to the LT Spice simulation. But for now, let's just take a look at what it looks like at seven megahertz and minus 30 dBm input. Well, first gotta turn the bias on back up to 150 milliamps total. And so there's our RF input. Now the output, as I said, I have to convert that to actual power, which I'll do um, and put it into a graph. But just looking at the screen, we can see there is a little bit of distortion there. And as I crank up the input, and I'll stop at minus 20, we can see it is starting to flat top there a little bit, but there's still plenty of headroom, I think, in this amplifier. Let me dial it back down now to minus 30. So like I say, I'll continue running the rest of the tests. I'll check them at different frequencies, and I'll put that in a graph so we can take a look at it next. 
And of course, before we look at the results for the IRF 510, I got to collect data on the 2N5109 board as well. So I've swapped it out, haven't changed anything else uh, in this setup. Uh, there is no potentiometer in this design, meaning there's no adjustment I have to do for bias voltages. They're all fixed with the biasing resistors. So what I'll do, I'll just connect the power up to it and we'll start at minus 30 dBm input as well and see what it looks like. And right away we can see the output looks lower. I have not adjusted the vertical scale um, on the scope. That's to be expected. The amplifier doesn't have quite as much gain as the 510. So let's see what it looks like as I increase uh, the input power. Looks very linear right now, at least to the naked eye. That looks like a sine wave. But you can see it flat topping now when I get up around minus 20 dBm or higher. So kind of see visually where that gain compression is starting. And like I said, for the 510, I'll run this through um, and collect the data from my meter. I'll check it at three different frequencies, plot it, and we'll look at the results. Okay, so here's the gain for the IRF 510 amplifier. I'm showing the actual performance by the solid lines and the LT spice simulation results by the dashed lines. The different colors correspond to the three different tested frequencies for the 40 meter, 20 meter, and 15 meter bands. The first thing to notice is the amp appears to be overachieving, meaning it shows I'm getting about 3 dB more gain than predicted. I'm not sure why that is, but I will go back and recheck the simulation parameters and my test setup to see if I made a mistake somewhere. But assuming these results are correct, there's no real problem here. I'm clearly not hitting gain compression yet with these input levels, and I can always adjust the pi attenuator between the first and second stages of the amp to dial down the overall gain if needed. I've also got a pi attenuator at the input of the final amp that I can tune as well to keep the drive power below 27 dBm. On the downside, the results do confirm the noticeable drop-off in gain with increasing frequency. That was expected. The IRF 510 is not a true RF MOSFET and is known to respond this way over HF frequencies. The other oddity is the gain at 7 MHz appears to increase the more I drive the amp. I can't explain that either, but I'm also not sure it's even a concern. Moving over to the 2N5109 performance, these results also show an overachievement, in this case by about 2 dB, which makes me think more and more that there might be an offset error somewhere. The data also shows gain compression kicking in at around minus 20 dBm of input signal, which is about 5 dB earlier than predicted. Now that does concern me a bit because that doesn't leave me any headroom to the minus 20 dBm signal coming out of the bandpass filter. I'm also a bit suspicious that maybe the 2N5109s I got off the internet might not be genuine Motorola new old stock. I know, that's a shocker, right? On the upside though, the frequency response is basically flat. I'm getting the same gain for all three bands that I tested, so that confirms this design has that as an advantage over the IRF 510. All right, so which one am I gonna choose? I can't decide yet. <laughs> I really need to build that final amp and then plug these into them and try them out with that final amp because its input impedance over frequency is going to be a different than a dummy load and we'll see how these perform together. Now, that'll be the subject of the video that I will do on that final amp and then make a decision on the preamp. So, as always, I hope you're enjoying this series and I thank you very much for watching my channel and until next time, bye for now.